Welcome to part two in our series, Going Inside the Technology of Mojaloop. In part one, we covered the purpose and principles behind Mojaloop. And now we will show you step by step what happens when one user, whom we call Gladys, sends money to another named John across a switch powered by Mojaloop. At the end of part one, I mentioned the three functions that Mojaloop performs in carrying out an interoperable transaction. Step one, looking up the person who is on the receiving end of the transaction. Step two, submitting a quote to that person's digital financial service provider or DFSP. Step three, carrying out the transfer of funds. In addition to these steps, there are also processes managing the settlement between DFSPs. Altogether, this points to the basic structure of the merger loop switch. It has an account lookup service, a quote service, and a transfer service. To perform its function, the account lookup service, or ALS, relies on what we call identity oracles, which are databases of account identifiers and the associated DFSPs. These oracles can be internal or provided by a third party. And settlement services within the merger loop support a number of core settlement algorithms and provide interfaces for custom integration with the ultimate settlement provider, a commercial or central bank. Connected to the switch are the DFSPs where Gladys and John have their accounts. To make it easy to follow, we'll call Gladys's provider PaySend since it is the payer participant that is sending the funds. And we'll call John's provider MoneyBase, since it is the payee participant that is receiving the funds. The connections between MojoLoop and these two providers are secured using industry best practice, including cryptographic signing that ensures transactions are non-reputable. Okay, with that structure in mind, we will now explore exactly what happens when Gladys sends money to John. It begins with Gladys entering the identifier for John and the amount of money, 1,000 shillings, she wants to send to him. In response, PaySend requests to look up John and whichever DFSP in the system has his account. That request goes through the ALS and the identity oracle for the type of identifier Gladys has entered whether that's a phone number, national identity, or some other type of account identifier. The identifier for both John and Gladys were registered with the relevant identity oracles by their respective DFSPs back when they originally signed up for their accounts. Since they are in the system, the identity oracle confirms that John's identifier has been registered by Moneybase. The ALS forwards the request to Moneybase to provide further identifying data like his name and date of birth. Moneybase sends that information back through the Mojo Loop switch as a callback to PaySend. An aside on reliability. Since the Mojo Loop platform needs to be robust for all operations and quality of network connectivity, we use asynchronous and reliable messaging patterns which minimize resources and gives the maximum chance of messages getting through when the quality of network connectivity between hub and DFSP is variable. Now, PaySend asks Gladys to confirm that she intends to pay this person identified as John. Remember from video one that like when transacting with cash, payments through Mojoloop cannot be revoked. This is because undoing a transaction after it's been done is an expensive thing to allow for, and Mojoloop is designed to make transactions simple and affordable. Since there's no reversing the payment once the money is cleared, we have to give Gladys the chance to back out, in case she has not recognized the person being presented as the potential recipient of funds. This is not the case yet, so she confirms her intention to pay John. In some user experience flows like USSD, this confirmation step may be delayed until Gladys is informed of any fees associated with the transfer, so that she only has to confirm once in the process and doesn't risk timing out the transaction. But in our scenario, she is using a mobile phone with a client application, so she can afford to be asked for confirmation at this early stage as well. Now that step one is complete, 
PaySend will create a quote for the transaction to ensure that both DFSPs and customer accounts are compliant and supported. PaySend submits the quote to the quote service in MergeLeap, which in turn delivers it to MoneyBase. MoneyBase then creates a cryptographic deposit slip in the form of an ILP packet and a condition and sends it back through the merge loop switch to PaySend. Gladys and PaySend are satisfied with the charges and services offered by MoneyBase, so now it's time to prepare the funds for transfer. That starts with PaySend reserving the funds for the payment and posting the transfer to MergerLoop. MergerLoop Transfer Service accepts and now it reserves the funds in PaySend's position account, making sure it does not exceed the DFSP's net debit cap which is the maximum amount that a DFSP in the system is permitted to transfer. This is the prepare stage of a transfer and it ensures that at the end of it all, not only will Gladys's account show a lower balance in PaySend's internal ledger, but PaySend's available switching funds will also be reduced. Mergerly passes the transfer post request onto MoneyBase. MoneyBase accepts, which means it confirms the ILP condition and generates the fulfillment, and it then authorizes the transaction. MoneyBase sends a response back to MojoLoop, which accepts, confirms the validity through the fulfillment process, and commits the funds against the position for MoneyBase, reflecting an increase in available switching funds. This is the fulfillment stage. With everything now ready and confirmed, MergerLoop notifies PaySend to go ahead with the transfer. PaySend accepts and completes the transaction. MergerLoop sends a similar notification to MoneyBase, which also accepts and then finalizes the transaction. At this point, Gladys is told her payment has been carried out and John is notified he has received a payment from Gladys and can use the funds. So there you have the specific functions that Mojuli performs in order for users like Gladys and John to have a fast and simple experience transferring money between each other. But hang on, I hear you say. We've just described the clearance of funds between payer and payee DFSPs. How can the payment scheme also be sure that settlement will occur? And how does it actually happen? Remember that a principle of a level one aligned system is that it is pre-funded. This means that for the two common models of settlement, multilateral net settlement, MLNS, continuous gross settlement, CGS, the DFSPs have collateral either in individual settlement accounts or pooled accounts. For multilateral net settlement, at the end of the settlement window, the net position is calculated for each DFSP. So if the settlement window is one hour, then at the end of an hour, DFSP that has sent more funds than it has received at that time, what we call a net sender, will have their settlement account debited. And a DFSP that has received more funds than it has sent in that time period will have their settlement account rewarded. In this mode, frequent settlements benefit liquidity efficiency and smaller DFSPs are better able to interact with all sizes of participants. For continuous gross settlement in a pooled account, the MojoLoop solution can act as a system of record. This allows maximum liquidity efficiency and is the ideal model when the settlement provider is a central or federal bank. Other combinations are possible, but let's stick with multilateral net settlement for today. Thinking back to PaySend and MoneyBase, let's say PaySend has 100,000 shillings, and money base 20,000 in their settlement account. Let us also assume that there's a third DFSP called ABC Finance, which has 50,000 shillings in its settlement account. Before Gladys makes her payment to John, we are near the end of a settlement window. At this point, each DFSP's position is as follows. Paysend's position is 22,000. Money base is negative 10,000 and ABC Finance's position is negative 12,000. The position is a representation of how much each DFSP owes to the hub operator to meet their transfer obligations. The hub operator is the entity offering the switch service. So this means that PaySend is a net sender that owes 22,000 to the net receiving DFSPs to settle its liability 
while well, money base is due 10,000 from the net sending DFSPs. The hub operator, in partnership with the settlement provider, facilitates these settlement transactions. When the transfer from Gladys to Johnny is prepared, Paysend's position is increased to reflect the 1,000 shillings she's sending to him. And when the transfer is fulfilled, Moneybase's position is reduced by 1,000 shillings. It now owes even less. In fact, like ABC Finance, it stands to receive funds. Now let's assume no more transfers take place and we reach the end of the settlement window. Based on its position, Paysend would have the settlement provided move the net settlement amount of 23,000 shillings from their settlement account to the multilateral net settlement pool. Once cleared, the settlement provider would transfer 11,000 to Moneybase and 12,000 to ABC Finance. We have a net zero set of settlement transactions. When the settlement window is closed and a settlement is triggered, all DFSP positions are reset, allowing liquidity to be restored and transfers to take place. This, of course, is assuming the net debit cap is not breached. For net senders, the hub operator might adjust the net debit cap to remain within the settlement collateral for each DFSP. The exact mechanisms will be specific to the hub operator, the nature of local regulations, and the DFSP's relationship with the settlement provider. But in general, this explains how multilateral net settlement works through a Mojo Loop switch. It also concludes our general discussion of the Mojo Loop process. If you are interested in testing for yourself a transaction like the one I described with Gladys and John, our documentation on Getbooks with the repos on GitHub will explain how to install a Mojo Loop simulator or use one of the Mojo Loop labs that are being hosted by community members. You will also find information on installing an entire Mojo Loop hub in case you are interested in joining our effort to improve the code itself. Thank you for watching, and I hope to see you again, perhaps within our community, as we pursue this mission to make digital payments interoperable so that digital economies may be more inclusive.